welcome to the Bill Cartwright Show with our special guest, real sports casting owner, Mark Lewis. Mark, welcome to the show. Thanks, Bill. Good to see you again. Uh, hope you and Sherry and uh, your posse had a good holiday season. We had a great time. We had a great time. And I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you've got a great family. You guys had a great uh, Christmas, great New Year. You got a lot of gifts. Or at least somebody got some gifts. I know I, I didn't get many. Yeah, you know what? I don't even think, you know, you have some grandkids. That's what we're waiting on. And I'm trying to expedite that because I tell my daughters, I, I, you know, your dad's 66 now. You know, I'm in the fourth <laughs> quarter, brother. I need some help. But no, uh, yeah, Christmas was great. My mom lives here. She's still alive. She'll be 88 in a month. And uh, so we're very blessed and fortunate. And I'm sure you feel the same way. And and you want to talk some sports now, huh? <laughs> yeah, you know, you and I grew up basically together, uh, same high school, Old Grove High School. Um, I think after that, you went to Chico, went right. to school, and you got into uh, the media, sports casting, which is uh, uh, a very competitive field, very interesting. And um so talk about that a little bit. Talk about your first job and what you were thinking about and uh, talk about some of the differences of what it was like then when you got out compared to what it is now. Well, first, I got to go back to like when I was little. I mean, little, little, like eight years old, I got a reel to reel. Remember those? Oh, yeah. Uh, the recorder to do. I wanted it pretend I was a play-by-play -play guy at, at night. And when I go to bed, I would call a game. So I always knew I kind of wanted to do that. But then I took political science at Chico. I thought, well, I got to be a news guy, right? So I went to Pocatello, Idaho. That was my first TV station. Wow. Back in 1979 when ESPN and CNN started. And uh, the sports guy, I helped him through a friend of mine get a job in Monterey. So they needed a sports guy. So I said, yeah, sure, I'll do that. I mean, because I couldn't really uh, see myself going to a car wreck and say, how did you feel when your husband got rear-ended by somebody and lost his life? To me, that's too intrusive. You know, I, I would, there's always another game in sports um, and I wasn't as good as you and your cohort. So I thought, you know, as a division two punter, I better figure out how to do this and make some money. So I became a sportscaster in 1979 in Pocatello, Idaho. And Actually, Dirk Cutter was a quarterback at Idaho State. His dad was a very celebrated high school coach in the area, Jim Cutter at Highland High School. And years later, Dirk and I would laugh when he came to become the coach at ASU that we'd come full circle. And then he had a pretty good career in the uh, NFL as well. But um, like, like you and I visited before the show, things have changed so dramatically. And I think a lot of it is um, two things. Um, the social media pervasiveness of these kids grow up about all they, they want to be on sports center. They want to be highlighted. Um, not all of them, but a, a disproportionate amount of them. And, and they're not willing to work, um, like you worked. Now we have year round coaches. We have trainers, we have training table, we have vitamins, you know, but do we still have discipline? I think the great ones in any era still have discipline, right? I mean, I don't know how many times Dan Risley had you down on the block, turn, pivot, shoot that little 10 to 12 foot jumper 60 million times probably until you perfected it and it was rote. I, I don't know. I, I think the media has been unfairly influential, if you will, in young kids as they try to attain uh, professional sports status because like what you did not even people go to d1 i mean the percentages of people who go and play at d1 is very small and it's even microcosmic if you get to the professional level right so there's been a lot of changes since you and i first started back in the covered wagons came over the ponderosa <laughs> but 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 don't you think that the mindset has changed and, and the reason I say that is that the the game itself has changed to where uh, even hitting now, everybody's a home run hitter. 
if you go to a baseball game, I go to a Giants game. I have no clue who's leading off. I have no I, nobody knows who the cleanup batter is going to be. You don't know uh, if the starting pitcher is going to pitch more than three innings. Yeah, and in, in basketball, um, yeah, thank God for Dan shooting a million shots for me. But I can promise you, there's nobody <laughs> teaching both stubs down there anymore. Uh, well, but I think it goes it goes back to the way you and I were brought up. I mean, your dad was he instilled a work ethic in you and and the and your sisters um, and your mom as well to make a, a comfortable home where you guys felt loved and you knew that you're always welcome. So many of these kids uh, these days don't have that. They have a one parent household. They have. Um, their coach who becomes their mentor trainer and they don't really have the ability um, to live in an environment to see our parents walk the walk. Now you saw your dad walk the walk. Well, plus you never saw a bathroom brother with six sisters. I mean, <laughs> you, you had to go outside, I'm sure. So you learned discipline and the regimen of the game. I don't see that at, at every level in every sport um, as the, the attention to detail as you had to have then. But I think a lot of it has to do, in fairness to today's athletes, you and the Elk Grove team and USF were year-round, but that was the exception rather than the rule then. Not every high school did that, right? You guys trained in the summer. You trained in the winter. You trained in the fall. You trained year-round. Yeah, it was it was a different type of play, and we did play year round. But we played; it was more skill. It was skill work. Now they play AAU, so they're yeah, you're right. They are playing, but they're playing, but they're not working on their skills now. Athletes now they're um, because of their nutrition, they're healthy, they're big, really fast, strong, they're well trained. But the fundamental stuff that we had, I mean, what do you think? Do you think they have the same fundamentals? I, I think they work hard, but I don't think they have the, the same fundamentals or knowledge. And I don't think there's a lot of people out there who have those fundamental or are able to teach fundamentals because that's not what they do. Well, and I think it's a two-edged sword, right? depending on what sport you're in, let's just take the NBA, for example. I mean, you see a guy like Pop, who's been coaching forever. He's not changing how he coaches. He's going to be very disciplined, attention to detail. He's an Air Force guy. I mean, he's very, very regimented, right? And then you have some of the younger guys, Ty Lu, who played in the league, who's got the respect of the guys because he did that. But when the Clippers play attention to detail, like I think he coaches, they flourish. A lot of these guys get out there and start freelancing. They'll they'll just default to freelance. Whereas you, you defaulted to, I've taken 15,000 of these shots. I don't even have to think about it. It's rope for me because I practice it so much. It became my default position. So I think a lot of that across the board in all sports, like you said, strategy in baseball. What's happened to strategy in baseball? I mean, now they've they've amended the rules so much and gambling. We never thought gambling would be just a part of the sport, right? I worked in Las Vegas early in my career from 80 to 83. And even though gambling was very pervasive there, and that's what Las Vegas is known for, nobody talked about getting down on the games unless you're in the mob. <laughs> you know what I mean? Now it's everywhere. So yeah, a lot of things have changed. And I think we're sounding like uh, get off my lawn, the old guys, you know, in the neighborhood. But I think you hit on something that is attention to detail. And ultimately, your goal is to be a better person and a winner, right, at every level. Winning at the professional level is everything. But like when you went to New York, what was Red Holtzman like? Was he like Dan? Was he very regimented or was he more freewheeling? Well, those guys were basic fundamental coaches. And Dan, even though he was regimented, you were still able to, if you see something, you were able to go ahead and 
and and do what you think is best. But it's uh, it's just a different world where you see the sinners now. Sinners are ball handlers. Sinners mm-hmm. are in the middle of the floor. Sinners are passers. Sinners are, are pass, screen roll. Um, they're not primary scores anymore, uh, with a couple of rare exceptions. So their their role has changed. And it's I think that's the interesting thing of how basketball, how sports has changed and evolved. Now, naturally, for a guy like me, I think, okay, basketball has changed and not in a good way because has Steph Curry changed the game and, um, you know, Golden State changed the way they're playing? That's even in that has changed because when we grew up, Everybody, every team had an offense that was theirs. Now, everybody runs the same stuff, which for us old guys is really bizarre. Well, and so what do you, you know? How will how how something like that happen, you think? I think, again, I mean, I hate to harp on it, but being in the media and having a lot of these kids grow up on the playground and seeing all these sensational highlights. Now we go back to when you were playing like Neek. I mean, he could get up and throw it down. Right. But he still played within the system. You know, he did that on a breakaway dump. He didn't just create one-on-one dribble for 20 seconds and then go to the hole. I don't see anything, at least in the NBA. Um, And we have DeAndre Ayton here, very gifted athlete, really sweet kid. However, he's not a five. He's playing more like a three. He's not even like a four. He has the physical attributes to to play that way. But the the game isn't that way anymore. Nobody throws it into you on the block and then back out and then back on the block like they did to you. And when you, I remember when you went to Chicago, I think you were telling me that you established, Phil would like to establish that presence down there because that opened it up for everybody else, right? To go down to you three to five times in the first quarter, down on the block, you turn and hit two or three jumpers. They got to honor that. Um, I don't see that much strategy anymore. I, I And I think the three-point line really revolutionized, not necessarily in a good way, the game. Because people get, they get mesmerized by that. They just start firing up threes because they know you get an extra point if you can knock some down. Yeah, they fire them up. Hey, uh, now we talked about ESPN. <laughs> now we watch the old ESPN, and we're seeing what's going on now. Talk about how that happens, because I love highlights. I love hearing from the coaches, the players, the GM, and their what they have to say. Now we have people talking about people, so we're getting third-hand information how does that happen to evolve that way well i i think it's it's pretty fundamental in today's media it's all about clicks that's how you monetize your platform right that's how espn does it that's how fox does it that's how cnn does it that's how all of the major media organizations have their monetization schedule it's driven by clicks so if the more provocative you are, personally, I don't like Stephen A. Smith. Not as a person. I don't know him. I, I just don't prefer that style of broadcasting. Um, and But there's a prominent place for people like him in the spectrum now. Um, I just, I was always of the mind as a sportscaster that you were gone all day. And I was a local sportscaster, so I only got five minutes to tell you what happened. I felt it was incumbent upon me as my responsibility to you to give you at least a primer of all the major sports that happened that day. I might throw in an editorial comment, but I wouldn't make it about me like Jim Rome and some of the others who are sensationalistic. So I I think it's been dictated, I know in our media setting, it changed dramatically with uh, 24-hour news. When CNN and then Fox came in a little bit later, it changed the landscape. It really diluted the business platforms, and you got a master's of business, so you know this, 
we used to be one of five opportunities in the Phoenix market to advertise on a newscast. Then now there's an exponential explosion of opportunities to advertise micro target your demographics, right? So then the viewing audience went away from local news. So local news had to now incorporate online 24 hours, have kids stay overnight. So it's, I think it's the changing of the guard and you really got to follow the money, right? It's all about following the money. Um, it's, it's like when I interviewed Willie Mays, when he was, you know, he probably was in his sixties at the time, but he was very bitter about not making money, but it, but it was his, it was a byproduct of the era he lived in. It wasn't that he wasn't worthy of that or Hank Aaron or any of those great players that played when we grew up, Mays, Marischal, Drysdale, Koufax. They were all just, it's just like houses when our parents, my parents paid 19 nine for our house. We grew up in Sacramento, in South Sacramento. Are you kidding me? You can't even buy a car for 19 nine, <laughs> 10 years old now. So money drives a lot of those decisions. And, and I think the business people around sports, whether they're in the organizations or if they're in the media, I think they pay way too much attention to that. Now you have to be pragmatic. I mean, you got to get paid. I got to get paid. They got to figure out how to pay us, but there's got to be a balance. I think it's all about who can scream the loudest sometimes, you know? Why do you, why do you think people follow? I mean, we can have a sportscaster on and you have no clue where they're from, what their background is, what they did. They're on TV, they're screaming, and they have credibility. How does that happen? Well, I think it would be analogous to, um, let's say, a guy like who you played with, Michael Ray, who came from Montana, right? He wasn't, he didn't get a lot of pub when he was playing in college, but he was pretty flamboyant. And the guy had some hops, and he was actually a good player. But he was a little bit... Um, more of a freelancer than probably a lot of players in your era. Um, so I don't know where he grew up per se. You probably do. Cause you know, him. Have yeah, to play he was my with teammate. Him. what's that? He was my teammate. Right. So did, did he grow up in LA or uh, a large well, urban I, area? He grew up somewhere. I, actually, he has not been on my podcast. So I, I haven't asked him that question. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, you know, you can have Michael Ray on and, you know, um, but a lot of those players, um, they were the exception rather than the rule when you guys played. I mean, I, I think today it's all about sticking out and sticking out your chest. Now, listen, we know sports has always been um, uh, about I'm better than you. But the people I prefer to watch do it with their actions. You know, Jerry Rice acted like he'd been there before. Larry Fitzgerald, who played for us for many, many years and went out unceremoniously because he didn't want to get uh, like Barry Sanders. He didn't want to be injured for the rest of his life with his kids. And, and we wanted to give him a send off, but he chose his route out. They did it, I think, with respect and remarkable skill. That's the type of player I, I prefer to watch. Now, let's talk more about the media guys. I'm more curious about how they get credibility. I'm a media person. So I can talk about a guy and kill him, but I've never played any sports. Forget that sports, any sports. But I have credibility enough where I can get a coach fired or at least help. Yeah, fire him. So how did they get credibility? They've never been in the sport, never played it. And they all of a sudden they have credibility and people are talking about it. So how does that happen? Well, a lot of us who are sportscasters were asking the same question, you know, <laughs> because we didn't wind up in Bristol. Now I did have an opportunity to go to Bristol early in my career when I came to uh, Phoenix after I'd been here a couple of years, but I couldn't see myself going in and being one of 40 or 50 in a, actually an area that's very cold and you and I come from Sacramento. We don't do, I don't do cold. Well, 
No. I really did. I did. Well, you spent a lot of time in Chicago, so you know what cold is. Yeah, um, it's really cold. And New York. But I, I think, um, excuse me, again, it's about clicks and who yells the loudest and has a little, still has a little bit of knowledge enough to be extemporaneous, think on their feet, uh, like a Stephen A. But like, for example, Skip Bayless. I mean, I work with Skip in Dallas. He was always the columnist at the Dallas Morning News, which is the provocative position in a paper, right? So if we go back to what your assertion is, if you look back in the day in Chicago or in New York, Peter Vesey, people like that who um, would typically weren't the journalists, they were the smack talkers in the business, but they were in the editorial position, right? They weren't allegedly a journalist giving you the information. I just think it's morphed into entertainment, I, you know? And if, if you have enough views and you're followed by enough people, that's, that's probably sufficient for management to a degree. Um, I've been out of the sports casting game actively for 10 or 15 years now, and it's really changed dramatically. So where, where do you see sports going now, sports casting going? So you, you are, now I'm going to give you a hard, a hard job. You're, you're going to take a young person and you're going to direct them to be a sports caster and get into the media industry. What are you, what are you telling them? I have done that and have been doing it, you know, for the, my entire career because I had the opportunity to be mentored by some great people as well. Here's what I tell them. In today's landscape, you got to distinguish yourself online with, let's say it's lacrosse. You become the go-to guy in the Southwest on lacrosse because then when Bill happens to do a show on lacrosse, your um, profile online is sufficient enough to warrant him having you on as the expert. And then based on that, you can grow your audience and you can monetize your platform. Now, to, to answer your question about going into the mix with an ESPN or Fox Sports at the network level, or like at WGN, a superstation, or at Cron in the Bay Area, anywhere that's a big area, that's still going to be difficult because a lot of these people are iconic. Jim Hill, who's been in L.A. for many, many years. Um, you see a lot of these guys who just live on their laurels. And really, like Creighton Sanders, who we grew up with in Sacramento. He wasn't that good, but he was always there. Yes. You know, and he liked to have a cocktail or two, you know. <laughs> but we, there wasn't much competition. So in the local markets, strategically, I try to tell kids and a lot of the kids that go to ASU's Cronkite School, which is a really renowned school for journalism here in the Phoenix area at Arizona State University, they're doing a lot more specialization. But here's a funny anecdote. One of my former anchors said, and she left probably 10 years ago, very well thought of, had a long career. Um, she goes, I just can't management style has changed so dramatically, especially as it relates to our supporting cast. She goes, we call them the 24s. They're 24 years old. They work 24 hours a day and they make 24K, <laughs> you know, because they're, hey, they're in the top 10 market, right? That's a great gig for them. But her point was, if she's tossing out to me for a live story to try and encapsulate it and enlighten the viewer and uh, the, the people in the control room, she doesn't want somebody who's 24 years old. They don't have enough life experience, right? So it's it has changed dramatically. You know, Mark, I still watch a lot of sports. And I... And you know, my wife Sherry knows I'll watch anything. It doesn't matter. We we're watching axe throwing yesterday. Cornhole? Yeah. Huh? Oh, yeah. 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 It doesn't matter. I, I just love to watch sports. So now, since sports has changed, what's your favorite sport to watch? I'm an NFL guy, which has been disappointing for us this year. And, and an NBA guy. I love Monty Williams. I really do. I, I like what he's put together. 
but I can't for the life of me. And, you know, you've been a coach at every level and at the highest levels and played at the highest levels. What the hell happened to the Phoenix Suns last year? What happened to the chemistry? What happened to the rotation? What happened to Monty? I mean, he was befuddled when Jason Kidd had his, he had him, he had his number, like you were talking about bringing the ball up. I mean, CP3, they double teamed him. They worked him. He's older. He, he's taken some miles on that body and he had to go to the bench. And Willie Green, who's the head coach of New Orleans, same thing. He was the head uh, assistant for Monty. He knew how to get in his grill. We had to fight, the Suns did, to get out of that first round. And I think we were fatigued. Then Dallas comes in and Jay Kidd, he's a pretty smart guy, right? So he figured it out. And uh, we lost game seven here at home by 40 points. How does that happen? Sometimes it happens. As a matter of fact, we were just talking about this uh, a couple of days ago, is that some teams, play, they play great to start the year, and that's where they peak. Some teams peak in the middle, and ideally where you want to peak and have all of your players playing well is at the end of the season. And so when that happens, it's, it's a beautiful thing. So it, you're really, really hard to beat. And – Simply, some teams don't match up. They just don't. And you're just going to have trouble. There's no there's no answer. You have no answer for a couple of a couple guys. And I think that's what happened in, you know, in the Dallas series. Uh, well, you look now. Really hard to play. They're just yeah. hard to play because yeah. they've got they've got shooters. Right. They've got a dominant player. He's got the ball in his hands all the time. He can make plays. And if you're you're not able to get the ball out of his hands early, like we talked about, uh, it's just a real problem. So maybe they need a tricky assistant coach like you to tell them, <laughs> hey, take the ball out of his hands in the backcourt. It won't be a problem. So, yeah. Um, well, it, it, the thing that I can't understand, it, it, it seemed like something changed in the chemistry of the locker room because the talent was still there. They weren't tired. The only strategic thing is what we talked about with CP3 bringing the ball up and he got beat up a little bit, but he's been beat up at the end of the year for the last seven or eight years. That's just kind of what happens to somebody at his age who gets that many minutes on, on him, right? And they've been able to overcome that. So, But I think adjustments are huge. Um, and you know, you've played for great coaches and bad coaches. You've been a coach. You've seen adjustments. You've seen rosters that you go, how am I going to win with these guys? You know, and then you somehow manage to do it. Um, I think it's Monty to a fault, probably. He's a wonderful man, very spiritual, very God oriented, has a strong faith. I don't know if he gets in their grill enough. And I don't, maybe that's overrated. Maybe that, from my perspective, as a non athlete at the level that you've been at, uh, maybe that's overrated. What do you think? Well, I think that this, and we have this discussion all the time. Um, we're good, but how good are we? And I know at the end of the year, I think about this. Who who made plays for us, legendary plays? Uh, Steve Kerr, Judd Bushler, Bobby Hansen, Right. Those guys came off the bench and made legendary plays for the Bulls. It can't be your core guys. We were fortunate with the Bulls. We were able to play 10, 11 guys throughout the course of the year. So then now Judd Bushler is a hero. Makes three threes in the playoffs in a big game. Bobby Hansen, when we're down against Portland by 17 points in the fourth quarter, they had to be spinning. He comes off the bench. He doesn't even play much. He makes two threes out of the corner. And they get, that, that, second team, that second group gets us back in the game. So you need you need others, somebody, and we don't know who they are, to step up. And so I, I think that that's really, really huge. And did that could that happen in Phoenix? Are they good enough? Are they deep enough to have that happen? Um I don't know. I don't well, know. I, I, think mean, that, I think that's a question that needs to be told. How good are they really? Well, and I think you hit on it. 
a lot of it is the luck of the draw injury wise, right? Yeah. Plus Jay Crowder opts not to even play, right? So now it's tough to move him. You don't want to move a distressed asset because you're not going to get value for it. This team just sold Robert Sarver's controversial tenure ended unceremoniously. The team was bought a couple of weeks ago. So from a standpoint, I think James Jones has done a great job as a general manager, and I don't want to make this a Phoenix Sun show, but to your point, there was Cam Johnson came off the bench last year uh, and supplanted Crowder, did a great job. Uh, Landry Shamit has been playing well this year. Cam Payne plays well, but they're all injury prone. So if you can't stay on the floor, it makes it difficult to get continuity, right? And you know, you've gone through your own series of injuries, breaking your foot on multiple occasions. Um, so I think the stars have to align. At least in the West, though, it seems like there's a lot of teams that have an opportunity to run the table this year. And that's interesting, too, that we talked about Robert. Um, they've had similar situations in football and baseball where the owner – um, or owners um, are determined not to be reputable people. And I mean, could that have happened 30 years ago to where the situation with Robert happened and now they're out? Could that have happened? Yeah, I don't know because um and, and that this is a good thing because I have daughters, you have a, a daughter. Yes. And yes. I, I think it's very important uh, that you separate um, the athletic talk from addressing somebody with respect. You, you, we've been in locker rooms, you know, albeit in my case, a division two locker room, but locker rooms are locker rooms. Same locker room. Yeah, it's 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 OK in the locker room. Once you leave that sanctum, you conduct yourself as professional and you treat people with respect. Right. Um, but, yeah, that's interesting. I, I don't know that it could have happened that long ago. But to be honest with you, I've been here a long time. We I didn't know the depth of the issues that Sarver had, but I knew the potential was there. <laughs> Well, as you know, I was there. I was with him for four years. So, um, you know, he he's he's a different guy. I didn't. I know that on some different issues, uh, I was really happy that he was able to stand up for for different groups. Um, but uh, yeah, he's he he's a different cat. So. I'm just I'm just curious because you know sports teams have always had quirky guys. I guess I can use that word, just quirky. Um I just really see sports as being really sensitive now for people, for their employees, but I, I could just never imagine that happening 25 or 30 years ago. People will probably say, hey, just tough it up. It's, you just gotta go to work. Yeah. Well, but I think it's indicative of society in general. I mean, look at the economy now and, and the inflation, regardless of your political persuasion. A lot of it's because th there's a lot of young people who don't have a work ethic. How is that instilled? That's instilled at home. You know, um, uh, they they seem to be real fragile emotionally for whatever reason. Um, and listen, we've had a lot of turmoil in the world, but no more than we had growing up, right? I mean, we had a lot of issues to overcome at the time when we were growing up. I mean, you grew up in a in a rural atmosphere where we, what would you say? You were one of 30, maybe, African-Americans at our high school? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but what's interesting about our high school is that we, you know, I mean, obviously we had black, white, we had some Asian we did have Portuguese, we had a, um, a Mexican, Hispanic. Uh, so we had a, a diverse group of people. And also we weren't a, a um, really affluent school. I mean, it was, it was a working school. So I think everybody shared that mentality. 
and people, you know, my our family worked. Yeah. So that yeah. was the real common thread, I think, for that group. I agree. Even though we were more of a blue collar environment. Yeah. I mean, we, we weren't motivated to go to Yale or Harvard. We we're motivated to go get a job and go to work. Well, but I think there's a lot to be said for common sense, and that doesn't necessarily equate with intellect, right? We all know a lot of people with PhDs who they have no common sense. Um, and I don't want to indict everyone with a PhD because certainly that's not appropriate. But um, I, I would rather have common sense and be able to exercise that on a daily basis because I think that'll serve you well. I agree. And and I don't know, maybe you had a similar experience that, that I did when I was at USF. And I always tell the story about how I was talking to two guys. They were both freshmen like me. And they were both talking about being owners of a company or being a CEO of a company. And that's what I'm saying is that we never had those kind of thoughts at Elk Grove. It was more about, you know, you're just going to work. You're going to work hard. Uh, you're going to go to Kasumas. Maybe you're going to go to Sac State. Uh, but you're going to work. So that happened later. So, uh, and like I said, I think that was more of our, of our, of our bond, the common sense thing. Uh, maybe that was part of it too, because um, a lot of kids don't have that now. And a lot of kids do not know how to work hard. Well, and again, I hate to harp on this, but I think it goes back to the family. Um, my parents, my dad was a teacher. So my, my dad said, you get a C, you're restricted. I said, what? He said, no, you, you're restricted. You're smarter than that. You, you, you could work a little bit harder and you get a B in any class. And I, so fortunately, when I was a teacher's aide for Bob Opp, who was also a basketball coach, and he taught geometry, that helped me get through geometry. But, but I had to work at it um, because I didn't have an aptitude for that. So then when I went to Chico State, I said, well, what major doesn't have anything to do with math or science? And it was broadcasting. <laughs> That's how I selected it. <laughs> okay, Mark, give me your, give me your top, I'll give you five. Your top five favorite athletes that you've interviewed and talked to. You only get five. The number one's Muhammad Ali. Wow. So when I was in Vegas, he was at the end of his career, and it was August of 1980. He was fighting Larry Holmes in October. I had just got to Las Vegas a month earlier. So they sent me out to McCarran El Airport at the time, and they used to have those long people movers in all the airports. Um, so I went to the end of that, met the jet, but he, but he was actually flying commercial with Bundini Brown. Hey, champ, but you know, Bundini's talking smack, coming off the plane, and Muhammad Ali is behind him just with his head down, and I'm really nervous. I mean, I'm just like 23 years old. I'm basically a rookie, um, and I'm trying to engender some kind of response from him. The first three or four questions, I made some generic references to the fight, and he didn't even look up. And then the fifth question I asked him, how do you feel about Larry Holmes calling you Porky? And Ali lifted his head and he goes, I show you how stupid Larry Holmes is. He don't know Muslims don't eat pork. And then we start having this tay to tay going back and forth. And at the end, he goes, it's going to be greater than the World Series. It's going to be greater than the Kentucky Derby. It's going to be greater than the Stanley Cup Finals. And he goes, you got to watch this fight. And then he gets right in the camera and goes, how was that? <laughs> I went, that's unbelievable. You know, so he's number one. Uh, Barkley, who you know, uh, is a good friend. He's a knucklehead. You can call him a knucklehead because he knows he is in a lot of instances. Um, but he's really charitably involved. He wouldn't want me to talk about that, but he does a lot of, good work in the community, um, which I think people who are modest should do and not draw attention to themselves. So he's one. 
Uh, Luis Gonzalez, who played for us and got the game-winning hit in Game 7 against the Yankees in 2001 when I was here covering the Diamondbacks, greatest guy in the world, the everyman, the working man, still had some talent in terms of staying in the show for a long time, but he he wasn't at the pinnacle of his profession, but he was always very gracious to us. Um, I was in the locker room and I was saying, Gonzo, you just got the game money hit in the World Series. And he goes, he goes, can you believe it? I mean, he was like a little kid. He was genuinely excited. You know, conversely, Kurt Schilling wouldn't even make eye contact with me for five minutes after <laughs> after they won the World Series. Um, so t- two more. I mean, it's really difficult because I had an opportunity to work uh, as a talk show host, as you know, after I left sportscasting um, in the newsroom. And I got to meet a lot of great individuals there. Um, Lenny Dawson, class guy, outstanding quarterback, carried himself with dignity. Um, And then Tiger Woods. I mean, I don't know these go in sequence, but Tiger was always good to me. He, he He would always take the time. I mean, it's not like we hung out, but, you know, there were a lot of athletes, as you know, especially playing with Michael, um, and I'm not saying Michael was bad. I mean, probably since I knew you, he was okay. Um, but a lot of these guys, and in deference to them, there's a lot of idiots in the media <laughs> that will ask a lot of ridiculous questions. So I thought, I mean, I thought Michael and Tiger were always good. Um, you know, so it, it, I think it's just a reflection of society to a degree. Randy Johnson, to be honest, wasn't. He wasn't real fun to interview. Um, I don't know if it was because of his persona. He thought he had to be um, more gruff. But those are just a few um, in the 30 years that I did it. Yeah, and I think it's, you know, as an athlete, you really go off of, when you're young, you're really answering questions. As you get older, you're just talking about whatever you want to talk about because a lot of times the questions are pretty messed up. Mm -hmm. So I definitely, uh, definitely agree with that. Uh, But you do learn. I think as an athlete, you learn for one thing, um, what you're supposed to be doing when I was a, um, a rookie, the guys that I was learning from, unfortunately we had a young team, but uh, it was guys like Marvin Webster was there. Um, the human eraser human eraser he was a great great guy before he got himself mentally messed up but uh, what a solid solid great person great family Um, so you really learn from those people so when you were young and you think about it now who did did you want to be like somebody I couldn't be like anybody because I couldn't be Will because he's like, a, <laughs> I couldn't be Kareem. I can't shoot that guy of a Skyhawk. So did you have somebody you really, really admired and you wanted to be similar to? I, you know, from an announcing perspective. Yeah. Um, I would have to say. Um, or just somebody you really admired because of, of what they can do. Yeah, I would. I I thought it was more along the lines of, and he wasn't really that much older than me. I think he's only ten years older than me. But Bob Costas, I thought he was the consummate professional. Uh, he didn't editorialize a lot. Uh, he was very knowledgeable. You could tell he was very well read because uh, so many of uh, our peers in sports casting just want to get in a screaming match and say the most provocative thing and like when Jim Rome and Jim Everett got into it and he called him Chrissy and then he kind of got on the national map and then all the news directors wanted him because he was provocative. That wasn't my style. I, more guy like, like Al Michaels or, or Bob Costas, they were workmanlike, they were still entertaining, but they were very knowledgeable and, and covetous of some decorum when they were on the air. Now, do you, Besides your business now, do you do you see, you know, people people are funny. They're like, Bill, you're retired. 
you're like you're like done. I'm like I'm not done. Uh, you know, you have no idea where I'm going to end up uh, because I, I I do still get job offers. I'm not going anywhere, especially not out of the country. Um, <laughs> but uh, is there a scenario that you can come back and and do something else? Well, uh, you know, I think we touched on this briefly the last time, but I have a real affinity for the stories of people who have had these near-death experiences and have come back to recount their experiences. And so we've created a pilot on that type of show. It's called Alive Again. And, and I think the important thing, at least from my purview, I, I will be able to be the moderator in the format. I never wanted to insert myself into the show, but it's kind of working out that way, the, the way we're going to portray the show more of a round table approach. And then we'll examine these stories and see what the, the final payoff is, but they talk about these life reviews, Bill. I mean, there's, it happens in 35 to 40% of these people who are clinically dead because resuscitative efforts, as we know in medicine have quantum leap from when we were kids, right? Yeah. They're bringing people back who have flatlined consistently and they have a consistent theme. And one of the life review consistent themes is every interaction you ever have with any person is chronicled kaleidoscopically to you and you can feel viscerally how the individual felt maybe when you were a jerk to them or you were less than at your best but also conversely when you stop and do the right thing because it's just what your character is that makes a bigger impact you help uh, an elderly lady change her tire and she was going to buy a gun because her husband just died of cancer and she didn't want to live without him. But because you just did the right thing, you then sent the ripple effect back into her. She founds a 501c3. She goes on to help thousands of people based on that one act. So I think to me, that's my passion now. And a lot of people go sports to that. Well, you know, sports is an uh, example of life in a kind of a microcosm every day, right? Winners, losers, rebounding. You don't, you don't necessarily, I don't think, learn as much in life by success as you do by adversity or failure. I mean, uh, and you've gone through it. We've all gone through it. Everyone in life goes through it. So I think a show like this will at least give people hope and um you know regardless of what your thought about the afterlife is there's some remarkable stories that these people come back with that sounds amazing and and i i would uh i would definitely want that that's good awesome. we'll count on it <laughs> yeah yeah not as somebody on the show but somebody that watches what happens well yeah we hey, don't want to. um We'll do this real quick. Uh, how's your family? They're great. You, As we started the show off, we're blessed. We had 12 here for Thanksgiving and Christmas. Um, my brother, Scott, who you might remember, was a year younger than you. He lives in Southern California. He's getting ready to retire next year. My brother, John, lives here in town. He was seven years younger than me, so you may not have known him. But... My mom's going to be 88 in three weeks. My nice. wife and I have been married for, it'll be 34 years in September. Not as long as you and Sherry, but we didn't meet in junior high either. <laughs> <laughs> we met in Dallas when I was working at a station in Dallas. Oh, and there's another gentleman real quickly, Tom Landry. I never liked the Cowboys, to be honest with you. I couldn't stand them. But when I went to Dallas and had an opportunity to meet him, one of the most respectful individuals I've ever met in my life. And his wife, Alicia, was the same way. And when we would interview him on our Sunday night show, at the end of the show, it was like 1030 and they just played a game. Tom would say, Coach Landry rather, would say, Mark, you have to ask Alicia. So we would ask his wife, is it okay if Tom does the show? Of course, Mark, that's fine. And uh, it really changed my temperament about how I view some people that I really don't know. You know what I mean? He was class personified. He was a great guy. That's that's awesome for me because I am a big Cowboys fan. 
Ooh, and my wife will love that. She is too. <laughs> one of the reasons I really like the Cowboys is that, for one thing, they were really innovative. When we were growing up, uh, they would throw on first down. They would run out of the shotgun. Uh, so they were just different. And I really like that. And also, it brings me joy that people, they do one of, they do one of two things. First, they check if they're 49ers fans. They'll check their score. Okay, 49ers won. Then they'll check the Cowboys score and see if the Cowboys won or lost. That's true. So it's, it's really amazing to me that when the Cowboys win, not that the Cowboys are great, I think that they're uh, kind of a little bit of a country club group, but people watch them, uh, whether they like them or not. So it's, it's just, it, it does please me uh, very much. But uh, Mark, thank you so much for being on. This was super awesome. Well, it's, uh, I'm it's just a pleasure happy. and an honor. And real quickly, I mean, you're too modest to say it, but what a wonderful career and what an exemplary life and as a father and as a husband, as a coach and as a friend. I mean, um, you, you could have been a, a lot more flamboyant, but that's not who you are. It doesn't mean you won't talk smack occasionally. If somebody wants to read Sam Smith's book, Jordan Rules, there's a particular passage in there we won't get into. But um, you could be animated and and you had a passion and you worked hard and so i appreciate that and you and thanks for having me on